know about you guys, but I remember the day when Edward Snowden's NSA uh, news dropped, right? To me, it was a turning point. I was a journalist at the Wall Street Journal at the time, and suddenly this revelation was there. My God, there is an entire system of surveillance here. I think it was a turning point in the public debate over privacy and security, and things haven't been the same since. Now, much of what Snowden revealed at that time and what he's been talking about ever since from his exile in Russia, it really is relevant to crypto in a whole host of ways. So to talk about that, he's joining us from Russia via video link. And I want to welcome to the stage Coindesk Executive Editor Mark Hochstein, who will be leading the discussion. Come on up, Mark. Take it away. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And good evening, Mr. Snowden. Thank you for joining us. with you. Oh, it's a pleasure. <laughs> I was uh, reflecting on the fact that it's been nine years since you revealed to the world the surveillance activities of uh, the US government and other uh, major Western governments. And I wanted to start the conversation by asking you, uh, compared to that time in 2013, would you say that the situation for digital privacy is better? Has it improved? Is it worse? Is it about the same? What, what's your assessment? You know, I, I think the introduction had it right in that it was a turning point. Um, things are still problematic, uh, of course. Uh, this is to say they're better in some ways. Uh, they're worse in others. But the difference is now things can get better because we understand the threat. Uh, prior to 2013, you know, there were experts, there were academics, there were people in the audience right now um, who understood that this was possible and that it was probably happening. Uh, what I mean by this, of course, is the construction of a system of mass surveillance. Uh, but broadly, publicly, and institutionally, this was treated as a conspiracy theory. It was supposition, right? Um, it was suspicion rather than fact. 2013 allowed us to move from uh, that suspicion into a recognition the, the, the world is different. This is real. This is something we have to deal with. And this is a very old tweet now. Um, but if you look at what changed, uh, the application of encryption began to spread and be layered everywhere uh, because we understood that the path that our communications cross is hostile. Uh, whether you're reaching a cell phone tower where, uh, you know, um, AT&T is basically turning your records into a profit center to law enforcement where they're using uh, sort of the information they've collected from your call records. And if you were born after 1987, they have a record of every call you ever made that passed their network. Um, or your movements and locations, your association with your handset to the nearest tower, um, that's kept and that's saved and that's recorded. Mm -hmm. And they believe that this is their information, not yours. You have no control over these records. You can't direct how they're used, how they're disposed of. Um, and we didn't know, we weren't told, and we would be kept in the dark forever. Um, I was wondering, uh, you know, when I was struggling with should I come forward or not, because of course I knew the consequences would be terrible. Mm. Um, you, you know, uh, what would happen if I didn't? And I think this is kind of what happens with everybody here who like, why are we gathered here? Why do we care about this? What is the point of like an independent form of finance? Uh, you know, gold is great, uh, but gold is not portable. Gold is not transmissible uh, beyond borders, you know, at the, at the tap of a button. Uh, Bitcoin and crypto more broadly is. That is an astonishing thing, and that gives us an indication of the power of how the world can be changed. But the problem is we have to understand the world as it is. And I, I think what 2013 said, what the problem that we have now, it's what we're looking at, is we constructed or had constructed around us a system that was and is 
fundamentally unfair. Mm. I mean, what do I mean? Look at the economy. Uh, there's an increasing concentration of resources into fewer and fewer hands. We see this same style of financialization creeping, creeping into the crypto ecosystem. Um, which actually, actually in, that brings you know, me to um, something I wanted to talk about, which is that there is understandably, uh, politically and culturally, uh, especially in the US, a backlash right now against crypto. Yeah. Um, and uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, a group of 26 concerned technologists, including no less than Bruce Schneier, sent a letter to Congress highlighting the risks of cryptocurrency. And, and there's one extraordinary sentence that I'd like to, to read and get your reaction to, uh, because it, it, it touches on the privacy question. Quote, most public blockchain-based financial products are a disaster for financial privacy, semicolon. The exceptions are a handful of emerging privacy-focused blockchain alternatives, and these are a gift to money launderers. What, what does Edward Snowden make of this dichotomy? Uh, I, I know Bruce Schneier uh, a little bit, and I have respected a lot of his past work. I, I read uh, his book on cryptography uh, ages ago. Um, and I, I lectured at his course at the Harvard Kennedy School uh, each year for, for a while now. It's, it's been a little while, uh, but prior to that, I have. Um, and, you know, when you look through the signatories of this uh, letter, Bruce Schneier is sort of everybody recognizes. The others are sort of an assortment of Twitter trolls that's a little bit disappointing to be associated with. Um, and then people whose names largely aren't recognizable. Um, I'm sure some of these people have great backgrounds and use, but when you read the actual letter itself, uh, you wonder which one of it, them it was that actually drafted this and proposed this, because it's this argument more than anything else, I think centralizes or, or expresses the flaw in the reasoning the most. They are saying, uh, this does not do this thing largely, but where it does, it is also bad. This mm. is damned if you do and damned if you don't. Uh, what is it that they desire? What is it that they want? The letter is an argument for the status quo. Mm. Um, someone, uh, another cryptographer responded to that, uh, Matthew Green at Johns Hopkins University, I think quite elegantly. Um, and he summarized their ob objections in four points largely. Cryptocurrency is terrible for the environment. Uh, we all understand that it's changing. We understand the argument. Um, these are referring largely to older proof of work algorithms, which are a sort of a legacy institution. They've served their use, but even where proof of work is being used, the energy mix is being greenified. It's improving, right? This is energy that would otherwise be wasted or landlocked. And even where it's not, we need to understand that <laughs> energy that is being produced is going to be used regardless of whether it goes here or there. Uh, second objection was that uh, public Blockchains can never support banking features like transaction reversal, uh, which is, of course, also wrong. Uh, many of the blockchains that we see being used, even side chains being used, smart contracts that are released on Ethereum, uh, have reversibility type features. They have blacklistings and burns. Mm -hmm. uh, they have the centralization that is not desirable uh, for a free and fair economy. Um, but it is possible, right? For, mm -hmm. So for those who are fans of those, it's simply wrong. You can layer things. it on top, in other words. Right, e exactly. Or you can construct it from the bottom up. You can create your own competing chain right. uh, that has whatever rules you want. This yeah. is simply programming, right? Mm -hmm. It's not magic. Uh, and then uh, the idea that cryptocurrency doesn't scale or that fees are too high. Uh, is again wrong. You know, they're, they're talking about Bitcoin, you know, uh, sort of traditionally in the slowest manner. They're not contending with things like lightning. They're not mm -hmm. contending with the fact that, you know, we have seen this used and implemented in places like McDonald's and Starbucks. Uh, it, there are so many ways to address all of their concerns that they don't address at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people who have signed this letter can or could understand this. They certainly should if they're putting this reasoning out there. Uh, and unfortunately, they didn't, which leads all of us to ask the question, I, I think, why? Uh, we should expect better from them other than the ones who are like uh, prolific public trolls. Yeah. Uh, but if their argument is not constructed seriously, we really shouldn't take it seriously. So uh, it was revealed uh, a couple of weeks ago that you had participated 
in the ceremony um, that had created uh, the original Zcash back in 2016. You had done so uh, under the, the pseudonym John Doberton. I believe that that's right. And um, tell us why you didn't go public with it at the time and why, why you waited until uh, six years to allow that uh, information to become public. Sure. So I've, I've been a fan of the technology behind Zcash for a long time. In fact, before there was a Zcash, and this is how I got involved. Um, I read the original paper uh, before Zcash was Zcash called Zero Cash, or at least that was my earliest introduction to it. Um, and I was really impressed by it because I've said and argued publicly for a very long time now, the core flaw with Bitcoin, uh, the largest sort of likelihood for why Bitcoin will fail in the long term um, is because it's not private. Uh, it is a completely public ledger as in the original white paper, which is great for the proof of concept. It's great for how it works. Uh, it is failing as an electronic cash system uh, because cash is largely intended to be anonymous, right? The transaction rate. We have people who are focused on ways to fix this. Um, here and there, particularly transaction rate, but we don't see the same level of effort applied to the privacy of transactions. People say, go to side chains, go do whatever. Well, uh, zero cash and then uh, later Zcash was an academic effort really um, to clone Bitcoin, uh, but then apply a, a new mathematical uh, technique called zero knowledge proofs um, to do what Bitcoin does in a way that no one could see uh, what these transactions uh, were on the chain. And you could do it anywhere from any kind of system. Uh, back then, to make this possible, there had to be the construction of some kind of secret key uh, that allowed you to like lock the whole network. The problem was, if any one of the people, uh, or sort of if the pe all of the people, rather, uh, who generated this key kept it for themselves, uh, they could counterfeit right, the mm -hmm. currency. So this meant that all of the people who were trying to launch this network had to find a way to um, ensure that at least one participant in the scheme uh, would not cooperate. They would destroy their key material, their part of the key, right? And as long as one honest person was in the whole mix, um, it would be a safe and secure network, right? Uh, and so this was really interesting. Uh, most of the participants did not know who each other were. Mm -hmm. uh, By design. And uh, I, yeah, right. Uh, and this was to, again, uh, sort of prevent coordination. And I was one of those sort of building blocks that made sure no one knew who I was except the core guy who invited me. Um, and uh, it was just a small way to contribute. And I didn't want to be seen as sort of uh, publicly endorsing the, the network for all day. I didn't want to be seen as sort of benefiting or profiting from this. I wasn't paid. It wasn't a corporate thing. I wasn't sponsored. I didn't have a stake. Uh, I wasn't cut in on this. Uh, the idea was just, can we try to do what we can, each individually, to make the system better? And now we look at Zcash, that whole ceremony uh, part has been cast away. Yep. It's been thrown in the dustbin. It's no longer used. Uh, and so this means it was okay, I think, uh, to reveal my role. Uh, and that, I mean, it was just something that uh, it felt good to do, uh, to contribute in that kind of way. And, you know, most of the projects that I'm involved with uh, really exploit my name, uh, like the mm -hmm. Freedom of the Press Foundation. Um, and that's a great thing, right, uh, where it's appropriate. But I think uh, it's much better to leverage your privacy when there's sort of that, that trust level involved. It's better if people contend with my arguments, right, rather than thinking that I'm like uh, the face of an ecosystem. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I can imagine being sort of a, for lack of a better term, celebrity in, in the privacy community, there's always that risk that, you know, just like in, in the financial markets, uh, there's this mentality of, oh, Warren Buffett bought this stock, therefore it, mu it must be good. And people, you know, don't do due diligence. They just think, well, Warren Buffett's smart, so if it's good for him, it must be good. And uh, do, do, you, do you see that, or that kind of risk for, you know, if you're associated with any of these sort of emergent tools, that people will use them not because they've done their homework, 
but because, oh, Snowden did it, it must, 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 must work. Right, and I mean, this is the primary risk that I was concerned with at the time. Uh, the funny thing is, I actually think Zcash is great. I've used it personally, I've used it repeatedly, uh, and I have actually uh, evangelized for it on places like Twitter. Um, as, as, but it's, as, a, uh, as, as, as an investment or as a tool? No, 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 no. For the technology itself, like generally I don't encourage people uh, to put their money in cryptocurrencies as a technology. And this is what distances me from, I think, a lot of people in the community. Like I use Bitcoin to use it. Uh, in 2013, Bitcoin is what I use to pay for the servers anonymously, uh, or rather pseudonymously, uh, because it wasn't anonymous, uh, that were the plumbing uh, behind how I transferred these files to these reporters uh, who, frankly, I couldn't trust them to protect me because they didn't know enough technically. Uh, so if I could stand up my own anonymous infrastructure for them to be able to get this independently, where even if they screwed up, it wouldn't connect back to me immediately. It would if there was enough legwork done, right? But I was just trying to build enough time uh, to actually meet with them in person uh, and get the cat out of the bag before we could all be thrown in prison. Um, and it worked, right? Uh, and, and since then, I've continued to use these networks, uh, many different networks. I've, you know, people think I'm just Zcash, whatever. Uh, I've used Monero. I like Monero. Mm. Uh, Monero has some problems, I think, technically, academically, but it's made huge improvements. Uh, it's still great. It's still useful. Uh, and there are a thousand other ones uh, that do all of these different things. And I think that's really the power uh, of this uh, community. Everybody right now is fragmenting into tribes because of the financialization of cryptocurrency. Uh, they're trying to make money off of cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. They're not thinking primarily, uh, what are the networks that are going to serve us in the next hundred years for transferring value? Or not even value, right? You know, whatever, NFTs and these other things. Uh, I am worried about a world in which identity is used against us. I am worried about a world in which our money is used against us. Uh, and what we need more than anything else is free money. Mm -hmm. Not in the airdrop term, <laughs> or, or in, not in the airdrop sense, uh, but in the independence sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think as much competition as we have there is all the better. So speaking of the letter Z, um, you know, a question that's probably in the minds of many people in the audience, uh, you know, given, given your location, is what's your, what's your life been like uh, in <laughs> Russia the last few months, you know, given that, the, you know, there's, there's a war on? Sure. Uh, I, I think the disappointing answer for a lot of people is that life is not that much different uh, for the ordinary Russian. Uh, you go out on the street, the primary thing that you see that is different are like stores are closing, brands are pulling out. Um, it's not reported, but we actually see brands pulling back. McDonald's just opened uh, here in Russia like a day or two ago. Are they taking uh, crypto The difference there? is it's not under... <laughs> yeah, no, I haven't seen that one. Yeah. Uh, Russia is actually strongly against, as far as I can tell, uh, cryptocurrency for payments. And most of the super states are like this. Uh, the smaller states, the ones that are uh, sort of harmed by the, the sort of great central fiat currencies of the world, uh, that's where we see the experimentation happening. Um, but in the central world, uh, we don't really, um, like, <laughs> in the largest states, you don't see the same level of payments uh, mm -hmm. because they see it as a threat. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you feel that you are able to speak freely um, given your location, about uh, uh, I mean, yeah, obviously I mean, you can I'm, speak freely about the U.S., but but can you can you speak freely about Russia? I mean, you tell me. Um, if you look at the history of my statements, uh, if you look at what I actually say publicly, uh, these questions have been answered and will be answered sort of again and again and again. Um, but this doesn't get covered, right? Uh, because these narratives are driven um, by what people want to hear in the majority of a certain uh, sort of cultural moral panic. Uh, but we lose nuance. And one of the reasons that I haven't talked about uh, sort of the Ukraine crisis in depth 
is because I know my comments are not going to be covered like uh, appropriately. They're not going to be covered in context. So I write. Uh, mm -hmm. I haven't published it yet. I will uh, eventually. Um, but I think one of the problems is that everybody who is not in you know, Russia or Ukraine thinks they understand exactly what's going on. Uh, they have very strong feelings about it. Uh, and they are basically being made to feel this way by the information bubbles that they consume. Uh, I really wish this conflict hadn't happened. Um, and I really hope it will end as soon as possible. Uh, but I think there is a level of certainty that you know everything is known that is causing more harm uh, and actually exacerbating the conflict um, rather than resolving. Can you elaborate on that? Like we need to be more thoughtful and less emotional. Uh, and that's good advice actually on any topic. Fair. So pr privacy tools are hard to use often. You know, PGP never really took off as sort of a mass consumer product. Uh, cryptocurrency, um, you know, wallets can be a little bit con confusing, bewildering for first time users. Um, you know, you know, in in encryption is hard. Privacy is hard. Do you think that, um, is it realistic for the average consumer that they'll ever be able to, to operate anonymously online or have privacy online? This is the core challenge for everybody who's gathered here today. Um, it's not going to happen unless we make it happen. Uh, when we look at the pre-2013 world and we look at uh, the world that we have today, uh, we have become very good uh, on the most part uh, for sort of the technologist, uh, technologist tribe um, at encrypting the content of our communications. Uh, people are, I, I think, largely abandoning email. Unfortunately, it's used for a lot of things still, uh, so it, it's stuck on there. Uh, but most people are using Signal. Most people are using, uh, you know, WhatsApp. Uh, I wouldn't recommend using like these uh, central services, uh, mm -hmm. like anything owned by Facebook. Uh, people are using Telegram, which again is not very uh, reliable. But even Telegram has, you know, an end-to-end -end encryption uh, feature. You have to find it. It's hidden. It's called secret chats. Uh, but something like Signal, uh, anyone can use. Literally, a child can use it. Uh, your, your parents can use it. Uh, and people do. More and more with each passing year, they do. Uh, when you type something into your browser window, uh, in many instances pre-2013, your connection to that search engine was unencrypted. So every time you typed in a key, that went over the wire in the clear. And I, sitting at the NSA, could see that on the wire. I could literally see your search query um, get posted one letter at a time in the logs, right? So I could see your thoughts being formed as you type. Now, uh, Google can still tell that. Facebook can still tell that because you're encrypting your communications to them. Mm. Um, but the people who are haunched on the wires around the world, whichever government you don't like, maybe you're concerned about the United States because you live there and where that power will be applied to you. Maybe you're concerned about Russia. Maybe you're concerned about China, right? Maybe you're concerned about North Korea. Maybe you're concerned about Israel, right? Um, any of these people can set up facilities where they see the traffic that crosses uh, their appliances. Now we protect them, we wrap them. They can still do traffic analysis. They can still see what signal is going where. They can derive a lot of information about your pattern of life. When you become active, when you're not active, are you using a certain network? Are you connecting to a certain website? But they can't see, for example, which article you're reading on the New York Times. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are some um, sort of caveats there. Uh, based on uh, sort of the size of the volume of communications that are going past that you can make inferences about this. Uh, but the idea is we've only solved one part of the problem. Uh, we have partially solved the uh, encryption of the content of our communications, mm -hmm. right? They can't read uh, an encrypted message going between you, party A, and you, party B, if you're using the right kind of messaging. Mm -hmm. They can still see that connection between you, that part on the social graph. They know the, you the talk me, to this The person. metadata, as it were. It, 
Right, right. I, I try to avoid using that term because most people don't understand what it means. But for, yeah, for those in the audience, metadata are roughly, you can, they're activity records, right? Mm -hmm. It's the fact that a communication occurred, the parties that were involved, uh, when it happened, how large it was, uh, how it was routed, this kind of information is called metadata. That is still unprotected. You can think about it like a, a van driving down the highway. Um, that is the encryption. You can't see who the passengers are if the glass is blacked out. But you can still see the fact that the van left. You can mm -hmm. see where it left from, and you can see where it ended. Um, and you can see what time it traveled, how long it went, what type of van it was, this kind of thing. Uh, but what's inside the van is wrapped. We're doing uh, quite well at covering the wagons as they mm -hmm. pass the trail, as it were. Uh, but what we need to do better um, is we need to actually make sure that no one can observe that level of network detail. We need to make more transactions look more similar so everybody is riding the same kind of vans, right? We can get lost in the crowd. There are some trade-offs and costs associated with that. Uh, it's not necessary everywhere. But we need to focus on that metadata problem. More generally, though, when you're looking at Bitcoin, we're not encrypting the content communications there, right? It's an open ledger. Everyone can see where these financial flows are going. And it is already a business to yep. reveal who is sending what to who. Uh, it's very common. It's, you know, well known in the space. This is not a big secret, but it's not being addressed enough. Uh, and that kind of competition, uh, unfortunately, if it is uh, sort of not addressed, it's great for the world. It's very bad for Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I don't know why every time I give comments uh, on sort of Bitcoin, uh, I, I am repeating the same thing because the developers know about the issue. Yeah. Uh, and they could fix it and they are working on it. But, you know, it's not 2013 anymore, guys. Uh, yeah. You have one more year until it will have been 10 years. Yes. Um, we're almost out of time. Uh, I did want to get your thoughts on central bank digital currencies. Is there any scenario in which you think they could be done the right way? Well, I, I think the uh, core question here is who controls them? If the central bank controls them, then we have a centralized currency. That's the problem. Uh, more, more specifically, I, I think people miss um, the interesting thing about cryptocurrencies. There's a lot of cryptocurrencies, or at least a few cryptocurrencies, like Bitcoin, which I am still very much a fan of. I don't want people to misinterpret my comments. Mm -hmm. um, uh, many cryptocurrencies are not so much currencies. They are closer to money than currencies. People don't understand the difference of it, but uh, sort of money is a thing that holds value, a token that can be exchanged, uh, that is not independently uh, controlled by any sort of central authority. Uh, if it's script that's being issued, uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, whether it's being issued by Goldman Sachs or the Federal Reserve uh, or the guy down at the corner store who's giving you, you know, free coupons, uh, that is a currency. Uh, we have too many currencies that are too unreliable. And that is one of the things uh, that, that cryptocurrencies, uh, sort of as the misnomer goes, uh, are beginning to address is actually we are seeing the transformation from cryptocurrencies into cryptographic monetary instruments. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time and your insights. Let's uh, get a round of applause for Edward Snowden. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Stay free, everyone, and enjoy your, your uh, conference. <laughs>